sponsored by CuriosityStream, now with my streaming service, Nebula. The whole idea of a foldable iPhone is back in the news this week after front page text John Prosser first tweeted about it and then talked about it on John Rettinger's YouTube channel. Both times he said the current prototype is less foldable and more hingeable. Rounded, iPhone 11 style design, but no notch, just a tiny, tiny forehead with face ID on the outside. To which Steve from OnLeaks first replied, LOL. Then BS, just all the internet letters. Luckily they respected it out, made up, which is cool, but that's not what we're here to talk about, is it? I'm Renee Ritchie and this is what does a foldable iPhone even mean right now? There have been rumors of folding prototypes and even patents floating around for almost a decade. I first heard about them around the time of the iPhone 4 or iPhone 4S. Honestly, that whole half decade is a blur. Anyway, I heard about Apple prototyping both bigger iPhones and folding iPhones at about the same time. And in hindsight, I'm now left to wonder out loud if it wasn't for similar reasons. The need to grow the displays but the desire not to fully blow out the size of the cases. Apple of course eventually chose to go with the taller but still one-handed ease of iPhone 5 before giving in and going fully big and bigger with the iPhone 6 and iPhone 6 Plus. And since then, Apple's gone full screen, but there still hasn't been a single fold or hinge in sight. Now, it's critically important to remember two things when you hear about future Apple predictions. First, from financial analysts like Apple buying Netflix or Disney or Tesla or whatever it was last week, DuckDuckGo, they just wanna move the market for their clients, which we are not. Second, from reporters, even about leaks, that Apple is big enough and has enough resources to prototype literally anything, any blogger, any podcaster, any YouTuber could think up years before they're thought up, hundreds and hundreds of times over. When Apple says they say no a thousand times for every yes, that means they're coming up with a thousand things you never see for every one thing you do. For example, Apple prototyped televisions for years, but ultimately decided it just wasn't the right business for them to be in. Apple's been prototyping automation and augmented reality for years and has productized ARKit, CoreML, and LiDAR, but hasn't shipped any robots or glasses, at least not yet. AirPods though, those shipped. It would almost be more noteworthy, more controversial, more concerning if Apple wasn't exploring and prototyping any major technological trend, especially ones so potentially impactful to their core business, like foldable phones. That's just in general though. When the reports get specific, well, that's when it gets interesting. Because as you know, I always care way more about the how and the why than just the what. The story of human technology is in part the story of foldables. We fold books, we fold wallets, we fold sandwiches. If you're civilized, you fold pizza. We do it to reduce the length and width at the expense of adding depth and to protect the inside by sacrificing the outside. Also, folding is just fun. It's cool, it's satisfying, like the sound of a snap or the crunch of a potato chip. We're seeing that now with the early adopter foldables already on the market. LG has perhaps the simplest version on the market. They make a phone that goes into a case containing a secondary display and additional battery. Apple could conceivably do something just exactly like that. Add a smart connector and an accessory that turns the standard iPhone into a dual screen iPhone, the way the magic keyboard turns the iPad Pro into more of a traditional computer. I don't think they will. Not that Apple doesn't know how to drive demand and make money at the accessory game. They most assuredly do. Just that I don't think a snap-in case is an elegant enough solution for Apple in this particular case. Motorola and Samsung both have riffs on the classic flip phone, the clamshell. Motorola has a clever hinge mechanic and an actual usably sized screen on the outside of theirs. And Samsung has plastified glassy stuff on the inside of theirs, but they remain very similar in concept. They let you carry around a fairly huge phone without having to have fairly huge sized pockets. Apple could also conceivably do something just like that, a more easily pocketable Apple pocket watch, so to speak, that flips open into a full sized iPhone. You know, something that's a little less Dick Tracy and a little more Kirk to Enterprise. I'm guessing Apple would wanna get a little further down the foldable glass path first though, minimizing creases and maximizing protection from dust and liquid ingress. But I'm also guessing this specific type of foldable is probably a little further down on Apple's to eventually do list. Samsung and Huawei, kinda, also have biggish phones that unfold into smallish tablets. Huawei's is an Audi, not an Innie, which saves on screen and camera duplication, but also bails entirely on screen protection. It's like having a book with the pages on the outside. 
Samsung is an innie, small screen on the front cover, double width screen on the inside spread. And for all the fun vibes the flips have been getting, it's the fold that's been gobbling up all the productivity hype. Apple could certainly do something just like this. You know, hardware equivalent of a mullet. An iPhone Max when closed, an iPad Nano when open. They've got the software model and singular integration to likely avoid some of the growing pains Samsung and Google have been experiencing, and an actual, never mind huge catalog of tablet apps to run on it. And maybe, just maybe, and I don't want to jinx anything here, it'd even be enough to get Instagram to make a damn iPad app. Finally, for once, seriously. But I have to list off the same caveats for the Fold that I did for the Flip. The core components for a true foldable are still at around iPhone 6 level, which is perfectly fine for early adopters for whom the current uniqueness of the experience and preponderance of other phones at their immediate disposal makes it literally a zero risk proposition. For mainstream adoption though, I think all those same glass and ingress technologies are gonna have to mature just a little bit more before Apple's willing to graduate them out of the lab and into a shipping product. And that brings us to the hingeable, like a foldable, but where the two sides fold and the screen does not. Microsoft pre-announced a very wide version of just that back last year already, running Android, which is like Apple announcing phone hardware made by Motorola. Again, don't at me, or do, whatever. It's sort of a middle ground that tries to be, if not the best of both worlds, then at least avoid being the worst of both. You don't get that singular screen experience when you open it, but you also don't get that crease down the middle. And you get to use the latest and greatest chemically hardened glass and seal everything up for top level water resistance as well. It offers similar utility, if not at all the same experience, and can be every bit as fun to open and close, if not look anywhere nearly as elegant when opened. And it's also pretty much the same as what Apple was rumored to be working on way back in 2010 or 2011 already. But as you know, there's always many a slip betwixt a prototype and a ship. And as much as Apple's been willing to go to market earlier than usual lately with products like the watch and maybe soon glasses, they're also still willing to wait until they feel the technology or set of technologies are mature enough for the mainstream. Like, well, no spoilers. Personally, I've been saying for a long, long time that I think foldables are part of the future, at least until projectables become far closer to reality. So I would be all entirely in on an iPhone Max that opens up into an iPad Nano, especially for watching Nebula and CuriosityStream on the go. Nebula is the amazingly cool new streaming video service I'm building with a group of like-minded education creator friends. People like TechAlter, Ali Abdal, Sarah Z, Sam from Wendover, Sam from Half is Interesting, and many more. It's a place where we can try out new things without having to worry about the dreaded algorithm or being demonetized or just being told to stay in our YouTube lane. It's also a place where we can post all of our regular videos, videos just like this one, without any ads or sponsorships at all. In fact, new ad-free, sponsor-free content from all of the creators go up not just every week, but every day multiple times a day, which is great if you're tired of waiting for other services to update like, ever at all. Even special and extended versions of our videos, like I've been posting the full length versions of my interviews on Nebula as well. 45 minute chats with I Justine, Brian Tong, Walt Mossberg, and more to come. Again, things that would just get buried by the algorithm. And now, because Nebula comes bundled with CuriosityStream, you also get access to its thousands of documentaries and series by people like the legendary David Attenborough and Canadian hero Chris Hatfield, all for just $19.99 a year. A year. Seriously, it's the absolute best deal in streaming today. Just go to curiositystream.com slash Renee Ritchie for unlimited access to the world's top documentaries and nonfiction series, and now Nebula as well, and enter promo code Renee Ritchie to start your membership completely free for the first 31 days. Thanks CuriosityStream and thanks to all of you for your support.